Nightmare Troubadour. I've I've literally never heard of this game. Nightmare Troubadour is a DS game that came out in August of 2005. Not only was this the first Yu-Gi-Oh game on the DS, but it was also the last Duel Monsters era game. This game marked the end of an era for the Duel Monsters run of video games. The Duel Monsters anime was coming to an end, and the next series was on the way. While the ending to the OG series is probably one of the best endings an anime can get, the games didn't get to end on a bang. Yu-Gi-Oh games up to this point have not been stellar. Some games were good for a Yu-Gi-Oh game. In the grand scheme of the market, the better ones were serviceable at best. I don't think a single Yu-Gi-Oh game at this point was even close to the quality of most good games at the time. The battle simulators were just too repetitive and didn't have much else going on beyond dueling. The games that did have a lot more going on usually didn't follow a lick of the TCG or OCG rules. This made it very hard for buyers to be repeat customers for future games because oftentimes you didn't know what you were getting. Series at the time like Pokemon, Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, Tales, they were all very consistent in what they were and how they played. If you play Pokemon Yellow, most of the things that you learned in that game transfer to Pokemon Crystal. The game shares the same foundation. Final Fantasy VII and Final Fantasy IX share the same foundation. It has different ways to go about progression, but you don't have to relearn how to attack, defend, and how the ATB system works. Yu-Gi-Oh! was not consistent from the get-go. You go from a game that's just war, to a game that follows the manga's rules, to a game that follows the TCG and OCG rules, and then to a tactical game? This series was all over the place, and it doesn't help that each one was difficult, confusing, and or boring. How do you expect a child to stick to a property when you just release a whole lot of mid on a yearly basis? That along with the poor advertising of these games made it so that people were unaware that Nightmare Troubadour even existed. Nightmare Troubadour. I've, I've literally never heard of this game. Before working on this video, I thought Nightmare Troubadour was a well-known game. It's one of the few games available in the first year of the DS, which was an uber successful console. So you would think that it would have sold well on that merit alone. And for the most part, it did, I think. I can't find the sales numbers online, but I did find that the game received the Konami's best seal in Japan. It's difficult to find out what this seal even means because Google is abysmal. I'll assume it means something similar to most seals at this time, which is basically like it sold well in a certain region. So it sold well enough in Japan to make a profit at least and probably decent overseas. But compared to how the older titles sold, it was clear Yu-Gi-Oh was not getting the numbers that it used to get. You could tell that the game's past sacred cards were not doing too hot because tracking how many units they sold becomes difficult. I heard a number around 200k units sold for Nightmare Troubadour, but I can't find where that number came from. Also, counting units sold back then is very different to how units are counted now. Back then, the number of units sold to the individual stores was how it was counted, not by how many copies were sold to customers. So I wouldn't be surprised if the game had a lot of units on the sales floor, but wasn't being bought. I mention all this to bring your attention to the point that for a long time, most Yu-Gi-Oh games were not good by gaming standard. And people started to catch on to that. Which feels pretty insane to say because at the time, this was Konami's peak. We were getting back-to-back -back bangers from Konami consistently, but somehow they couldn't manage to make a Yu-Gi-Oh game that could see eye to eye with some of the giants. Only one Yu-Gi-Oh game I talked about on this channel that I feel like anyone can enjoy was Worldwide Edition, and that was mostly because it was short and sweet. Too many games were only Yu-Gi-Oh by name, so I can't recommend most of them to say a friend looking to play a game for nostalgia's sake of the TCG. And the battle sims are too long and repetitive for the average person to sit down and play to the end. Whose bright idea was it to just force people to duel opponents 5 times plus in order to progress? Your first 50 duels in these games will be some of the most mind-numbing gameplay ever. And it doesn't help that the games were often slow with a shallow card pool. So the deck variety oftentimes ends up being stale. Speaking of card scarcity, these games were often missing whole cards. Oftentimes, I see the question if battle sims of the past are a good way to experience the format at the time. And my answer often to that is, Hell no! It's one thing for these games to be missing a card like Mr. Volcano. 
Because honestly, we do not care. But several of these games will be missing some of the biggest meta defining cards of all time. For example, multiple Yu-Gi-Oh games were missing Last Will, a card that came out near the start of the life of the TCG and OCG was not in several uh. Yu-Gi-Oh games after Eternal Duelist Soul. It did not make an appearance again until Nightmare Trovador. Why? How did you get it right the first time and end up forgetting about the card for four years? This card is the golden ticket to Cyberstein, one of the most infamous cards in Yu-Gi-Oh history. One of the cheesiest cards in the game that allowed you to summon any fusion monster from your deck for some life points. A card banned to this day, and you just forgot? Scapegoat is another card that doesn't make an appearance in the games until Nightmare Trobador. Scapegoat came out in late March of 2003. Both World Championship 2004 and 5 came out well after the release of that card, and yet it was not in those games. Several top deck lists of the time have these cards in the decks, so these are not cards you could just up and ignore. Classic decks like Goat Control, Reasoning Gate, and so on simply did not exist in the games. Oh, I forgot to mention Reasoning was not in these games until Nightmare Trobador. Your thoughts? What? Funny how this is still kind of an issue to this day with Master Duel. The card pool in that game is so far behind the TCG and OCG that it's considered an entirely different game from paper play. And that's before you talk about the Roach. So the question is, does Nightmare Trobador fix the issues of the past Yu-Gi-Oh games? Does it have all the cards available at the time to be a good representation of what the format was at the time? Is this game more than just a battle simulator? Is this even a good game? Let's find out. The game starts off at Kaiba Corp where it's being shown that the company is having technical issues for unknown reasons. This is bad for them because they have to announce a tournament the following day. Fortunately, the issue fixed itself mysteriously. You don't realize it yet, but this event is the reason why everything strange happening in this game is happening. What? The game jump scares you with three questions right off the bat, and your answers determine what cards you have. At the time, I thought this affected the whole deck, or at least a part of it. But no, your answer only determines what six cards enters your deck. 34 of the cards are picked and pre-constructed for you no matter what. Six cards might not sound like it makes much a difference, but it does, because this is probably the worst starter deck I have ever played with. The first question in the game determines what two monsters are added to the deck. I chose the S word, so I got the Red Snake and Whiptail Crow. Having these monsters makes the early game a lot more manageable, but they fall off mid game. Moving on to the magic cards I got, Meteor Crush and Sword of Deep Seated are the next pair. The sword is okay since it can equip to anything. You also get it back too if the monster dies by putting it on top of your deck. The issue though is exactly that. It's a downside, not an upside a lot of the time. Wasting your top deck on a card like this in tight situations sucks. And Meteor Crush is so ass, all it does is give a monster a piercing effect. Fucking thing sucks! Plenty of cards can pierce without the need for this equipment. Better to just have one of those over this trash. I used the sword for a while, but I took it out once I got better cards. The last question is for a pair of trap cards. Needle Wall is a card straight out of Joey's deck. Each monster slot on the board is given a number, and you roll a die. If there is a monster in the slot that shares the same number as the die result, No! My Beaver Warrior! Wabaku is the other trap card. This card pretty much saves monsters from being destroyed that turn. Decent trap cards that saw play as tech every now and then in the TCG. Four of these cards are much better than 90% of the cards you have right now. It's legit just a Yugi Kaiba starter deck, but somehow worse. Usually in the past few battle sims, they give you a few key staples to give your deck a little kick but not this game. After the dream, you wake up in a room almost forgetting the fact that you have a tournament to enter today. I swear waking up and forgetting the big day has gotta be one of the biggest tropes right next to Amnesia. Speaking of tropes, like an anime girl late to school, you run off to the card shop. At this point, I think most players notice the fact that the self-insert in this game actually has dialogue with themselves and several other characters in the story. I kind of prefer this over the silent character in story heavy games. In certain games, it works well enough like Pokemon. 
But in other games, I feel like it takes a lot of the win out of the heavy moments. I say this to sneak in that Maya being a silent protagonist in Persona 2 was the biggest mistake. That being said, I understand why the silent protagonist is usually silent in a game like this, because the character is basically you. But I wish in these Yu-Gi-Oh games that Joey was the main character. Cause I'ma let you know right now, they hold this guy like crazy in this game just like in Sacred Cards. Anyways, you head outside and you go to the shop and you notice that the store owner is not there. But in his place is Grandpa. And he starts to explain that he's watching over the store as a favor and that it's not fair that his colleague decided to up and take a break at the worst time possible. Man, shut your ass up, man. You old as shit. Why is that nigga? What's up with This is the point where he starts to press you like a fed about your information. You name yourself, the hometown you hail from, and you also name the town that you enter in the mid game. Although at the time you don't know that. Once that's all done, you're told all the rules of the tournament and the way it works. See, on the world map, which looks mighty similar to the overworld in SMT, you use the touchscreen to navigate around it. At the start of the game, the only buildings you could go in are the card shop and your house. Later on though, another location pops up and every now and then there's a building that pops up on the map. Besides that, there ain't a lot to see. While moving the cursor, every now and then it changes color. The color changing means that someone nearby has a dual disc. It's a little mini game of playing hot and cold on the map until you find the spot where the duelist is at. A little crystal that looks like the ones on top of the sims the will pop up once you find the duelist. This system is reminiscent to the system in Worldwide Edition in a way. You can't see who the duelist is until you're right next to them, just like in that game. However, in Worldwide Edition, if you beat them once, they are no longer hidden from you. In this game, you can't tell who the opponent is subsequent times after the first unless you reach a certain point in the game. There is another way, but I'll talk about that when I get there. When you travel around the map, the time passes. Certain events and areas are only available at certain times, so you might have to plan around the clock every now and then. Something else they explain to you at the orientation is that you gain experience each time you duel someone. The main character has a duelist level in this game similar to Sacred Cards. In Sacred Cards, the duelist level locks you out of using certain cards if your level isn't high enough. In this game, you can't make progress unless you go up a few levels. A lot of the progression in this game is locked behind certain duelist level ranges. Even packs will only unlock if you have a certain duelist level. I was hoping by skipping the days traveling around the map to pass the time, you can force yourself into the next part of the game, but as far as I know, you can't really do that. Now, let's talk about the duels in this game. In one of the battle simulators I talked about, duels were painfully slow and not very appealing on the eyes. Did they learn from the sins of the past? It doesn't. In some ways, it feels slower. Every time you play a card, an animation plays. For magic and traps, it'll show the card activating, which is standard. But for monsters, a whole GIF animation pops oh out of the card. God. Most of these range from serviceable to ugly. This is the game where they wanted to take things up to the next level, and I appreciate the effort. But an option to turn these off to speed things up would have been nice. Even when you battle, you have to see an animation of the card sliding in and out of the screen and after that, you have to see an animation of the card being destroyed. You can feel the speed of the game drag the duels like crazy at the start of the game. But fortunately, once you get further in the game, it's not as noticeable. The issue is still there, don't get me wrong, but I think the reason why it feels so bad at first is because the beginner duelists are absolute dick on the ground dog water. They are trash! Think about a good boss fight for example. They tend to take a while to get through, but you don't really notice how much time is passing because the fight probably has you completely engaged. If trash mobs took several minutes to beat, you probably grow bored of the game and just lose interest in playing it altogether. Early game encounters in most games tend to take less than 30 seconds because of this. A minute at most and that's probably a bit on the rare side of things. Early duelists in Yu-Gi-Oh games take several minutes to beat and they are not engaging in the slightest. It's the equivalent to just mashing the attack command in an RPG, but extend that to 5 minutes. Most Yu-Gi-Oh battle games have this problem. As much as I shit on sacred cards and forbidden memories, the trash duels don't take long at all because it's all quick and snappy. However, the card pool and rules are a lot simpler and uninteresting, and that's probably why it's so snappy. 
there's not much going on. The more games they make, the more complex the effects and interactions become, which will probably make the duels last longer. Longer duels is not the issue though. The issue is making the duelists have the worst decks possible, making the game a chore to get through. No, I do not want to fight 5 to 10 duelists that have a deck with no win condition 5 to 10 times each. That's why I probably enjoy WWE so much. You want to done the trash and move on. In this game, it's an issue for certain opponents for sure, but a combination of two things makes things different. One, your deck is complete ass. It's the biggest piece of dog shit. Good enough to roll over Taya, bad enough to lose to anyone else. Some of the early game duelists have decent decks for the period of the game they're introduced. A good example is the first person I dueled, Mokuba. Switch outfits with me. Mokuba has a low level beast deck that is more than likely a mile better than yours at the start. The defense of some of these monsters are higher than the attack of most of the cards in your deck. I could barely get over cards like Death's Koala. For context, my best low level monsters are Red Snake, Crow, Neo, and the White Shark. When this card flips face up by the way, it inflicts 400 what? damage for each card in my hand. There have been times where this card flipped face up and I lost 2000 life points. Death Koala is probably one of the best burn cards at this point of Yu-Gi-Oh too, and it's easily better than 90% of the cards in my deck. I think this is the best deck Mokuba has ever had in a Yu-Gi-Oh game, and it's just a koala carrying him. If he plays Forest, it becomes much more difficult to run over his beasts, especially the koalas. The only other notable magic card he has is Tribute Doll. He can use a card like this to make Big Koala only need one tribute to summon it instead of two. If this koala hits the board, it's over. I don't have a single monster that can overpower it. And the only card that I have that could kill it is Share the Pain, but I only have one copy of it. I often hear a lot of people drop the game because of how bad the deck is at the start. And you really feel it when you're staring at these koalas. The idea of people dropping this game because Mokuba filtered them with this koala haunts me. A fix to this would be to get more cards. The thing is though, you're broke as hell at the start. Can't start thinking about building a deck until you get some wins under your belt. The next opponent on the radar was Taya. Taya makes me want to pull my hair out. She's so bad and boring. And what makes it worse is the copies of Solemn Wishes. She gains 500 life points on her turns. Because of how slow the deck is, most duels with her in the early game feel like she had about 10,000 plus life points. With Mokuba, you have to be engaged enough to avoid losing too much damage to the koalas. Taya's deck literally has no win condition. It looks like one of those filler decks in Forbidden Memories. No idea how you can lose to this. Worst part is, most of the duels with her take about 4 minutes. These are the matches where you can really feel how slow the game is. Some of her cards have just enough defense to stall you out if you don't have the right cards in hand. She is good for farming if you want to avoid the other duelists at the start. And I think that was ultimately her purpose, cause the rest of the starting area duelists can fold your rubber band deck. Yugi's deck is almost ripped straight out of Duelist Kingdom. He has every classic Duel Monsters card you can remember him having. Usually, Yugi is a free win in other games. With how terrible your starting deck is though, you have to play out of your mind to stay even. The most annoying low level monsters he has is the Elf and Stone Soldier, both having 2000 defense. At this point in the game, I don't have many ways to break through these walls consistently. This usually turns into a situation where he tributes the walls for a higher level monster. Doesn't help the fact that his spells and traps are vastly superior to mine. Your deck is gonna be so ass. Something as simple as Horn of the Unicorn is enough to make you go, oh shit. Pot of Greed and Swords will give him a lot more tempo that you can't even catch up to at this point. Fighting Yugi will always be an uphill battle once he draws one of these cards. Even in situations where it seems like you're ahead, his trap cards can make it difficult to pin him down. Life Force Sword is an annoying card to get hit by at the start of a duel. It rips a card straight out of your hand and removes it for 4 turns. Magical Hats can just stall for time by hiding the target, and Spellbinding Circle prevents the card from attacking. Normally this card is bad because you can simply destroy it with like MST or Heavy Storm, but I don't have that much spell trap removal in the deck, so cards like this get away with murder. The only removal I have for back row is the ninjas but they're flip effect monsters, so they can die before they even fix the problem. Yugi's deck is too strong for me to swing at half the time right now. 
I lost my first duel with him because he simply equipped Horn of the Unicorn to a card at a crucial moment and I couldn't do anything about it. In my games with him though, I noticed that the AI is just as dumb as ever. Yugi has Mystic Box, which is a card that destroys one card on my side of the field then gives me one of his own monsters. Now normally a human player would give away a weak monster and swing at it, but the computer had the genius idea to leave it in defense mode and pass it to me. Then they summoned Beaver Warrior and swung at the monster only to fail because the card they gave me had 2000 defense. Stupid! Mind you, the elf only has 800 attack and the beaver 1200. On top of that, they flipped the other card in attack mode because they thought they could destroy the monster they just gave me, and now they just threw the whole game away. You just blowing from stupid town? Yo, Joey! What? You may not have the smarts to beat that thing, but we're giving up on you, Joey! Apparently, no one wants to face Joey. Not because he's annoying, he says, and it surely isn't because he's the toughest duelist. It's because his deck is just mad saggy and reeks of smoking cigars from a casino. His deck is a fusion of his Duelist Kingdom and Battle City deck. Actuator hitting the board is a life or death scenario for me, and I absolutely hate it. I only have one low level monster that beats over this card, and that's if he doesn't boost it. He has a few copies of Baby Dragon and Gator Sword, along with a single copy of Red Eyes and Versago. With these cards, he could make fusion monsters every now and then in some of the games. The minigame begins once you start to see his magic and trap cards. Graceful Dice is a classic Joey card. The result of the die determines how much of a boost his cards get. He also has the polar opposite, Skull Dice. This makes your cards lose attack depending on the die result. Dangerous Machine Type 6 is a card I've seen, but I've never read in my 20 plus years of playing Yu-Gi-Oh. This card rolls a die on his turn, and the result of the die determines which effect happens. It can discard a card from your hand or his, make you or him draw a card, destroy one of your cards or itself. This is a card that you see in a rubber band deck for sure. Thankfully, it's helped me more times than helped him. Same cannot be said for the last two cards. He runs copies of Needle Wall, if you remember this card from the start when they gave it to me, and Blind Destruction. Monster cards on the field are destroyed depending on their level and the die roll. So, if the result is 4, you destroy all level 4 monsters on the field. 3 means all level 3 monsters and so on. However, if the result is 6, all cards that are level 6 and higher are destroyed. Dueling this guy tends to be hair pulling because multiple cards will just spontaneously combust. With that wraps up day 1 and 2 of this game. I ended up fighting Yugi and Joey 5 times, Taya 4 times, and Mokuba twice. Even though this deck is complete ass, I will say that I was more engaged than usual with these duels. After all these matches, I was able to have enough pocket money to get some cards from the card shop. As challenging as it is to duel them with this terrible deck, I'd like to make something for myself and experiment a little bit. After all, this game is set in GOAT. GOAT's a format that took place around mid-2005. It's named that after the high usage of Scapegoat at the time. This was a community-made format that was created after the frustration with Yu-Gi-Oh at the time. If you want to know the format that pushed them over the edge... This dude did a 10 hit combo! This dude's doing straight! Not liking the direction the game was shifting towards, they wanted to go back to a time where Yu-Gi-Oh was a lot less combo heavy and had more of a focus on the grind game. Coming from fighting games, I'm always a fan of grassroots effort. Even if I'm not the biggest fan of the format, I tend to say to support your sister games and formats because at the end of the day, we all want to enjoy the game. I bring this up to say, if this game's format is set in place of one of the bigger fan favorite formats, why don't the players use this game as a resource to test and play? This question has been in my head before I even had the idea of making videos. I got multiple answers as to why that is. But for now, it's time to wake up to a brand new day and use the money that I got to get some new cards. I didn't mention this before, but this shop makes me feel very nostalgic. The shop I used to go to and play cards at was a lot similar to this one in a way. The dual terminal in the corner, the posters on the wall, and last but not least, the table in the center of the store and the foldable chairs is just... Speaking of tables and desks... Today's video is brought to you by Flexaspot. They have desks that you can choose and customize various things about, such as your preferred color and size. The desk I have here has a keypad that can adjust the height of the table as high as 50 inches off the ground, 
and as low as 24 inches off the ground. The table is incredibly sturdy, and it doesn't shake much no matter the height. This is because of the dual motors the table has. Because of this, it's the ideal place for me to do my sewing and pattern making. Sometimes I need a good look at what I'm making, so adjusting the height of the table to eye level helps a lot. The table I have is also big enough for me to sort out multiple decks that I owned over time. It's also the ideal spot to play cards whenever I have company over. I'm sure for plenty of people out there, this is the preferred desk to have your desktop on. If you're interested in one of their tables, please click the link below to view and purchase their products. Now coming back to the shop, there's three things you could do here. The first thing you'll probably notice because it stands out the most, and it's the password machine. Like other Yu-Gi-Oh games, you can insert the numbers in the corner of the card that you own in real life to obtain the card in the game. Unfortunately, you cannot use the password machine for now, so I can't speak more about it yet. The register is where you buy the packs. Most packs in the game cost about 150 points, so how often do you get packs in this game? The average duel tends to net me anywhere between 70 to 100 points with some being a lot more than usual due to the bonuses. I do it 15 times in 2 days. 2 in game days and you'll end up around 1000 at the least to 1500 points without factoring the bonus points. Most of the duels took around 4 minutes to complete so that's about an hour worth of gameplay to end up with that many points. Seems terribly long but let's compare it to 2004. The average dual early game in that game takes about 6 minutes without the speed boost. With the speed boost, it's about 5. Crazy how Nightmare Travador has all this fluff and is still somehow faster to get through than 2004. Man does that game blow ass. When you win a duel in 04, you get 5 cards from a pack immediately. So 15 duels which will take an hour and 15 minutes give or take will net you 75 cards in 04. After my 15 duels, I ended up with over 2200 points in Nightmare Travador, enough to get me 15 packs which is clearing a box and a half. Each pack gives 5 cards so the amount of cards that I get for this is about 75 cards per hour. Not that much faster than 04, but I think this is probably the baseline for card progression in Yu-Gi-Oh games. As much as I shit on 04, I think that game and this game probably hit the sweet spot when it comes to card progression. 75 cards per hour is a lot much more than most of the early games, and possibly less than future entries? Now in 04, when you open a pack, the game autosaves, so you can't save scum to see what's in the packs. In this game, however, you can save scum like crazy to see the contents in the pack. You can also save scum to pull rare cards early in the pack, so you don't have to end up spending too many points. I didn't do the later strap because that would've took too much time, but I did save scum to see the cards in the pack. If you pull enough cards, you end up getting a checklist of the cards in the pack, making it a lot easier to remember what's in it. After seeing what's in the packs, my mission was clear. First, get Pot of Greed from the Miracle of Nature. This is a must-have for any format that has this card legal. The other cards in the pack are okay, but they all have the stench of falling off mid-game. Shadows in the Labyrinth had Swords of Revealing Light. It's a really good card at this point of Yu-Gi-Oh to stall with. Not to mention the fact that most opponents for a while in this game don't really have spell and trap destruction like that. The only other notable cards in this pack is trap hole and negate attack, but it's not necessary. The next two packs are the ones you want to focus on for general good cards at the start. Mechanical Power's chase card is Graceful Charity. This card combined with pot and swords gives you so much advantage to work with throughout the entire game. The consistency of good commons and rares in these packs are a lot better than the other packs as well. The first pack has a card like Man Eater Bug as a super rare. It's a good card, but it's way too hard to get. Meanwhile, Hain Hain, a card that does something similar, is a rare, making it a lot more likely to pop up. Thunder Dragon is also in the pack if you want to start working on an incomplete chaos deck for the post game. Keyword being incomplete. The New World pack is probably the best pack to get at the start if you want to work on a deck theme. Cards that support certain types are in this pack. Son of a bitch. Oh shit, look, it's Lord of D and Flute of Summoning Dragon. Two cards that were missing from the game since Eternal Duel of Soul. Four years of not being able to make a dragon deck. Insane. The standout card in this pack is Royal Decree, which can shut down trap cards and a lot of plays in this game. 
However, the cards I really wanted was Wall of Illusions, which is a card that bounces back attacking monsters to the hand, and Jurai Gumo. This spider is the highest attack low level monster in the game, which means I could get over cards like Death Koala and Mystical Elf a lot easier. The catch? I have to flip a coin, and if I call it wrong, I lose half my life points. Now in paper play, this card is garbage. However, in this game, it's a godsend. Most of the early game opponents don't have an answer to this card or Dark Elf, which is another beat stick with a drawback. You can rob games blind with these two cards. The best part is not the power of the cards though, it's the drawback of these two cards combined. See, at the end of a match, you get bonus points depending on the actions and events that happen in the duel. Having these cards make it very easy to get the comeback related bonuses, because more than likely you're winning the duels with 1k life points or less half the time with these cards. Not to mention the bonus points for finishing the duel fast with these. I tend to be gaining more points on average because of this, which allowed me to buy more packs. Now my deck is a hundred times better. It's all coming together. I have cards with good attack ranges like the Extra Crows and Neos, and with three copies of Yami, they could reach over 1800. Crimson Ninja and Trap Master are in the deck to pop trap cards. Hain Hains are my monster removal for now. I didn't get my hands on any Wall of Illusions, but I plan to eventually. In my quest to get cards, I ended up with several copies of Spellbinding Circle, Negate Attack, and Wabaku. For now, it'll do. These cards are much better than most of the cards I had in the deck before. After upgrading the deck, I head on over to the table. This is where you learn the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh! And not just the surface stuff, the tutorial is extra thick! Something else that you could do at this table is the dual puzzles. Dual puzzles are makeshift in-game scenarios that you have to solve. Most of the time, they want you to win in one turn. If you play Duel Links, you might be familiar with these a bit. But the dual puzzles of recent times ain't shit compared to the ones of the past. Dual puzzles as of recent are mostly tutorials to teach you how to play a certain deck. These puzzles are more like state tests for Yu-Gi-Oh. I remember absolutely loving these back in the day. And a good number of these can really beat up your brain. The first one is very simple. You have to swing with the right monsters against specific targets and make an opening for the mystical elf. The second puzzle is like a multiple choice question. You have Karibo on the field and several monsters in hand. This puzzle was basically this math problem, and I shudder to think of anyone that got this wrong. That's pretty much how the puzzles work in this game, but they start to get tricky really soon. The first one I failed was the fourth one. You start with a hand of La Jin, Swamp Guard, and the Bistro Butcher. If you know me, you know how much I despise this card. And you, I just plain don't like you. Not only does it make your opponent draw two cards when it does damage, but for some godforsaken reason, they keep giving Merrick this card. And it's mostly because it goes with its theme of deck destruction. Most deck destruction decks force the other player to ditch cards that they gain, or just ditch cards entirely. Why would you use a card that only makes them gain? Anyways, on the field you have Lava Guard, and when both guards are out, they give a boost to each other. Mushroom Man, Dark Magician of Chaos, and Karibo. You serious? All you gotta do is summon the Swamp Guard to give the boost to both of them and win the game. I bet this puzzle was trying to catch players that don't read cards off guard, and they say Yu-Gi-Oh players can't read. Psych! That's the wrong number! Huh? I looked at my replay flabbergasted because I have no idea what the fuck went wrong, and that's when I saw it. Look how many cards are in the deck on top of the screen. I was looking at the bottom screen whenever I dueled. I didn't even notice the size of the deck changes over the course of a match. So you're supposed to use the Butcher to deck them out. If only Merrick saw me win with this dumbass condition. The rest of the puzzles are a bit tricky, but I managed to get them done in a timely fashion. I did about 10 puzzles for the day and felt like that was enough. When you finish a puzzle for the first time, you get some points. For the beginner ones, you only get 50 each, so in total I got an extra 500 points a day, which is pretty nice. Time to wrap things up here and head on outside. Bakura has the zombie trio, just like Bones, along with some other vanilla fiends and zombies. These cards are not much of a problem for me at this point, however, he has Heart of the Underdog. Whenever he draws a vanilla monster, he draws an extra card, and he'll keep drawing extra cards until he draws a non-vanilla card. This card is usually used in fun decks based around normal monsters by trying to gain advantage with spell cards that have a strong effect at the cost of a normal monster being present. Alright, you're great zombie. Every zombie deck in the 2000s has this card. 
When it dies in battle, it grabs a zombie right out the deck that has 2000 or less defense. Zombies are known for having horrendous defense stats, so this effect boils down to the fact that you can summon almost any zombie in the game. This includes the higher level ones like Patrician of Darkness. Not only can he summon a monster with high attack points that easily, but it also has a very annoying effect. It basically turns the game's battle phase into Magic the Gathering. As long as it's face up on the field, he can choose your attack targets. So if you're trying to kill one of the weaker monsters, he can choose your attack target to be the vampire instead. Way way back, people used to think that this effect meant that he could change your attack target to one of your other monsters. With multiple copies of Turtle and Sangin, expect this card to come out often. Book of Life is a must have for zombie decks. It revives a monster along with banishing one of the cards in your graveyard from play. It's also another way for him to bring back the vampire or turtle to get to the vampire. Call of the Mummy is a permanent spell that allows him to special summon a zombie card onto the field if he has no monster. With this, he can summon the vampire without paying the cost to summon it, and then normal summon a monster. Enchanting Fitting Room is a card I have not seen in ages. You pay some life and pick up several cards from the top of the deck. You then special summon all the cards that were level 3 or lower and shuffle back the rest into the deck. This card makes it very easy for him to swarm the field without much effort because all of his zombies are level 3. The most annoying card in his entire deck though is Ectoplasmer. This is another perma magic card and as long as it's face up on the field, at the end of a player's turn, they have to tribute one face up monster they own. Once that's done, you inflict damage to the opponent equal to half the attack of their tributed monster. This card is extremely annoying because it slows down the momentum of the whole match to a crawl. If you summon a monster, it will be dead by the end of the turn. To get around this, you gotta set the monsters to avoid this effect and then flip them up at the right time to swing back. This deck has a lot going on and since he only pops up on the third day onwards, I assume they expected the player to have built something competent enough to face them off at this point. Something to mention from this point on is that multiple opponents will start to have staple power cards. Things like Pot of Greed, Charity, Swords, Premature Burial, Call of the Hunted, etc. I fought several other duelists in the day including Mako. I don't have much to say about his first deck though. His second deck is a whole nutter story, but I'll get to that later. Something I noticed over the course of the last few days though was how trap cards worked. See normally trap cards have to be set first and can only be activated on the next turn and onwards. By next turn you have the option to activate trap cards between phases, activate it as a response to certain actions, but in this game it doesn't work that way all the time. First off, you cannot activate most trap cards in between phases. This is problematic because any trap card that requires you to activate in the standby phase like Trap Dust Shoot will just never activate. The second thing is that a lot of times you cannot start a chain with a trap card in response to a summon. So in this situation, they summon a card while I have Skull Dice face down. The game will not prompt me to ask if I want to activate the card. It's not like I want to activate it now, but just the fact that I don't have the option to is kind of crazy. Now this error doesn't occur to every card. Trap hole cards and cards that negate summons work fine, but it's really problematic that the two functions of trap cards in this game just don't work. This is one of the reasons why I felt like this game is not proper for the GOAT format experience. Whole functions of certain card types just don't work. Later on in the day I meet up with Yugi again, but something's off about him, or at least to the main character. By saying things like, oh you do it my partner, the main character ends up thinking that he's a schizo. Yugi has no time for you though, cause it's getting late and dangerous, so he tells you to go home ASAP. Once you get home and wake up the next day, you see that you got some mail. Unlike most mail that you get from a fake billionaire, this one came from a real billionaire. It's a warning to the duelists in the tournament that some goons have been stirring up some trouble every night. For what reason is unclear, but for now it's best that you don't stay out late from now on. I go out and duel a couple of regulars, including Rex. What did he say? Honestly, not much to say about Rex Raptor other than his deck sucks as, and it sucks as later too. The notable card in his deck is Gilosaurus. He can special summon it to swarm the field or tribute summon it for a bigger monster. Issue is though, if he special summons this monster, you can special summon a card out of your graveyard. Get out, loser! Here! So these are the cards to summon Exodia! Next was Weevil. He has a bunch of terrible vanilla insects that probably destroy whatever plan he's going for half the time. Kakuna Evolution is a card that could transform into a Great Moth or Ultimate Great Moth in 4-6 turns. Unfortunately, it takes 4-6 turns to do that, so this card sucks. 
he also has to own those cards in his deck in order for the card to transform, which means he has a ton of bricks in his deck. Take that with you. Get out of my fucking sight. Now, the main goal of his deck is to use DNA Surgery to turn all your cards into insects and use various floodgates and destruction effects that only affect insect cards. When Hopper dies, he can special summon almost any insect in his hand. This allows him to summon Insect Queen a lot easier. The Queen is probably one of the worst boss monsters of all time though. It can't attack unless they tribute a monster. To circumvent this, it can make a token at the end of the turn if it attacks meaning they have to sacrifice a whole monster just to attack and then get a shitty token afterwards. There's no guarantee that that token will be there by next turn, by the way. In the same day, I caught up with Bones, and he has the worst zombie deck of all time. It doesn't even have a single Pyramid Turtle. The only card I mention in his deck is Vengeful Bug, which literally turns the game into Magic the Gathering. What's with all these cards turning the game into magic? All your monsters get summon sickness and they can't attack the same turn they hit the board. Once you upgrade your deck, the only duelists that give you a challenge is unironically Mokuba, Yugi, and Bakura. The rest of them are eh. The game starts to shine a bit when I fight those three, but when I fight everybody else, it don't look too good. Well, it's about time I start heading home, so let me just get one more game. Melt your powers in eternal light. Show these fools your unstoppable might. Bars, bro. I was ass. Docs forces the player into a shadow duel with no other option. Each time you move at night, there's a chance a goon might appear and force you into a shadow game. Now, if you win, the payoff is huge. You get extra points for winning the shadow game. However, if you lose, it's game over. All the progress you made since the last save is lost. It's been a while since I've seen a Yu-Gi-Oh game that has a game over screen with the potential to lose your progress. Off the top of my head, the only ones I remember having a penalty like this is Forbidden Memories and False Bound Kingdom. Sacred cards for Chef and Worldwide Edition also have a penalty to make you lose a card, but those are games where you can save at most times. This game, I could only save back at the house at the start and end of the day. You can make a trip back in the middle of the day, but that usually felt like a waste of time. Especially since none of the opponents have been that much of a problem at this point since the upgrades. All this to say that Dox is kinda buns. The only problem in his deck is Jurai Gumo. They try to make his deck a coin toss deck. With second coin toss, he can reflip for the Gumo effect. However, Dox won't swing with the spider half the time, even if he has second coin toss. The AI is just not built to take the risk. It's also not built to make smart plays with his strat. The idea is that the devs wanted you to swing at the giant rat, which can get any earth monster with 1500 or less in his deck when it dies. Hey, I'm a rat! I ain't no snitch! Ah! This wall has about 3000 defense and zero attack. It will be the card that he usually chooses to summon most of the time. The issue is, the rat forces the card to be summoned in attack mode. If I have two monsters, I can just pop the snitch and end the wall right after. Now a human player would just have the rat float into another rat and then the wall, but not the AI. After the duel, Yugi pops up to make sure you're okay and gives you the rundown of what a shadow game is. This is where your character realizes that if he had lost that duel, he would have died, I, I meant be sent to the shadow realm. I find it funny narrative wise that the main character just thought it was another duel the whole time. That wraps up day four. At this point, I had 31 duels under my belt, minus the shadow duel. If you were to take my average duel time of 4 minutes and times it by 31, it took me a little over 2 hours to reach this point of the story. With doing this math, I realized this game takes way too long to pick up. I had someone who played a little bit of Pokemon casually play one of the games to reach the first gym and beat it. It took them a little over 15 minutes to do that. This is without skipping much of the text. It took double the amount of time for the story in this game to actually progress. You're too late. You see the problem here? If this game wanted to keep the attention of an average child, it probably failed by now. I think a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh games failed to hold the retention of most people because they were bad at pacing. Why continue a game when it feels like you're not going anywhere? Again, as much as I shit on sacred cards and forbidden memories, there's a reason people played the game to the end. Play one hour of either of those games and a lot can be done within that time. I saw a lot of comments in my community post saying that they dropped the game because it felt like nothing was happening and honestly, I don't blame you for dropping it. As an adult now, I feel waves of dropping the game. 
If I wasn't making a video on this, I would have for sure. Now it may sound like I'm shitting on the game, but if you saw my tier list, you can see that I have this game up in the higher tiers. How? For now, it's time to wake up and buy some packs. Inherited Will is the pack to buy for sure. Some of the best cards are in here. Most of these are better than whatever choices you made at the start of the game. Multiple effect monsters that have amazing effects, such as Penguin Soldier, which returns two cards to the hand with Flip, Giant Germ, which summons two germs from the deck upon its destruction, Mad Sorcerer, which helps you draw a card when it inflicts damage, and one of the chase rares in the pack, Cyber Stein. One of the most infamous cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, the Random Stein. But what if I told you that in this format, it wasn't random? Cause right along with this card in this pack, is Last Will. To top it all off, Meteor Black Dragon is also in this pack. And I somehow got lucky enough to get all the pieces and several copies of Last Will. Why am I geeking so much about these cards? Last Will will special summon any monster with 1500 attack or less from the deck to the field. However, this card can only activate if a monster on my side of the field went to the graveyard this turn. The usual thing is to use a monster that tributes itself to do an effect and then use Last Will. I can't do something specific like that. One of the things I could do right now is to swing with a weaker monster against a stronger card, but that's too slow and I'll end up activating the effect on main phase 2 after the battle fight. The best card I had to proc this card in main phase 1 was Share the Pain. It's a 3 card combo which is pretty hefty even for its era. But if it goes off, I get the special summon Stein from my deck for free. Then I pay 5,000 life points by chopping off my arms and legs, and I can special summon the Meteor Black Dragon. Look! Just a flesh wound. This combo trivializes the first half of the game. It's normally risky as hell, especially in paper play. But in this game, most of the duelists at this point don't have scary trap cards half the time. Now, even though I had access to the strat at this point, I didn't do it yet. I didn't want to fully commit card space to it yet. For now, I added some of the new beast sticks that I got like Lajin and Chaser. I put Stein in the deck along with Wall of Illusions and Mass Sorcerer. I figured to give my deck some kind of way to get card advantage and Mass Sorcerer was decent enough to do that. I added some Nuzzlers in the deck from the new pack. It can boost the equipped monster by 700, and if it hits the graveyard, I can pay 500 life points to put it back on top of my deck. Much better than the S-word because I have the choice to do it or not, instead of being forced to. With the Nuzzlers and Yami, the Sorcerer can reach high enough attack power to run over bigger cards, do damage, and have me draw a card for it. Last but not least is the other chase card I got in the pack, Mirror Fort, one of the best trap cards in the game. With this, I go on my way, and the first victim I meet is Serenity, Joey's sister. She's a duelist in this game for some reason. I guess that one episode in the anime was enough for them to okay this. I'm not gonna talk about her much, cause she plays as if she never got the eye surgery. Afterwards, we meet up with Joey at the spot. You'd think he'd be mad at us for folding his sister like that, but nah. Guess she gotta learn about this game the hard way. Welcome to the real world! Time to learn! You gonna learn today! The main character tells Joey that he's worried about Yugi because of the way he was method acting the other day. Joey slowly realizes what you're waffling about with the two Yugi thing. He explains Yugi's situation with a food analogy. A hamburger and a veggie burger are different types of burger, but they're still burgers at the end of the day? What the fuck are you talking about? He gives up realizing the example was piss poor and we just play a match. Later on in the day, I spot Yami Yugi. But my dark magician is one of the strongest magic cards in the game. His deck is revolved around getting any version of Dark Magician out ASAP. Whether it be Dark Magician, Magician of Chaos, Dark Magician Girl, Dark Paladin, shit, even Demon. He managed to ritual summon Chaos Magician on me. With Manji of a thousand hands, it makes it easier for him to do stuff like that. His deck is similar to Yugi, but they added more Dark Magician support along with some of his Battle City cards. Link is obnoxious as ever. Any card with 1900 attack cannot destroy this card. I just added Lajin into the deck along with Neos. If I play Yami, I can't get over it with those cards at all. Brain Control is a card that he could use to steal a card that I have and tribute summon it for Dark Magician or Dark Magician Girl. Magic Curtain can special summon Dark Magician by paying half his life point. I wouldn't be surprised if the AI never activates this card. I noticed that the AI does not like the idea of paying life points to do things. Dedication lets him tribute Dark Magician to special summon Demok from anywhere. It's a neat gimmick card to turbo out Demog. 
funny how this card was unplayable for years after Demok got banned. This Yugi has the classic Mirror Force, so setting up Stein while he has back row is always risky for me. My first game and most games after with Yugi are always nail biters. This is the kind of Yu-Gi-Oh Yugi boomers played, and I can see how they have fond memories of rubber band Yu-Gi-Oh. Over the course of the next day, I ended up with Yugi's number. See, this game has a friendship status with the characters. The more you interact with them and duel, the more they open up to you. This changes some of the small details like things they say to you. Multiple characters will go from being cold to you to being happy that you're around. Once you max out the friendship, they'll hand over their deck recipe for you to net deck. Flattered, but most of these decks are kinda stinky. Stinky! That shit is ass, boy! You could also start to trade them for cards that are only obtainable through them. I think a system in place like this is nice. It encourages players to do everybody multiple times for extra content and not progression. Too bad the pacing of the game is so horrendous to the point where it might as well be for a progression. Including the shadow duel that I had to do later in the day, I dueled about 50 times so far. Damn. Now some of these duels are lasting longer than 4 minutes a lot of the time. I estimate that I dueled for a total of 3 hours and 20 minutes on the low end, but I'm pretty sure it's closer to 4 hours. 50 duels is usually the point where I end up in stage 3 in a battle sim. Stage 3 is usually right before the mid game. It's so strange because the duels with some of the opponents at this point are decent, but the fact that not much is happening still kills a lot of the drive to keep going. Having this kind of pacing for a story game is abysmal. Can we move the fuck on? a new building has appeared on the map. I can't enter it yet, so I have no idea what it's for. I head off to the shop again to get some cards out, and in the new pack, it supports ritual and fusion monsters. The main attraction in this pack is mostly some of the bigger low star monsters. Upstart Goblin is probably one of the best deck thinning tools in Yu-Gi-Oh. Ultimate Offering, which allows me to have an extra normal summon for 500 life points, and Forceful Sentry, which can rip a card out of their hand for a cost. The problem with this card is that it's banned at this point of Yu-Gi-Oh, so you can't put it in the deck at all. What a waste of a card slot, is what I thought. Besides that, nothing much happened in the day besides some duels. Not even a shadow game. <laughs> Finally, on the second week of the game, all of a sudden you hear a bloody scream and run off to the origin point. The main character starts to run towards the building I couldn't enter earlier. Turns out it's an abandoned complex. All of a sudden, Serenity pops up and pleads to save her. We see that she's been kidnapped by Docs to lure us out. If I don't get stimulated, your son is getting eliminated! <laughs> Joey and Yugi catch up after the duel. This is their first time seeing who the goons were and question why Pegasus and his goons are stirring up trouble. Something's off about this tournament and they tell Serenity not to be out at night like that. Today, a new opponent finally shows up, Esperova. Bro, I'm really about to get your pickle chin that boy. His deck has the theme of hand vision and it's horrible. The only cards worth mentioning in this deck is the iconic Genzo, which is an incredible card in this game for its ability to freeze traps. The Fiend Mega Cyber, which is a card he can special summon if I have two or more monsters than him. It's like a combat card, but at this point he only has one in the deck, so it rarely happens. The last card to mention is actually the scariest card for me specifically, and that's Reflect Bounder. If you attack the card while it's face up in attack position, you take direct life point damage equal to the attack of the monster that swung. Because of the amount of life points I sacrifice a lot of the time for these big monsters, I run the risk of being walled out by this card without removal. I never had to worry about that threat from him, however, Wow, oh shit, two new opponents in one day. It's a Christmas miracle. His deck is a bit of an upgrade from his younger brother, but it's nothing crazy. They added cards into the deck that make it easier for him to tribute summon for the gate guardian pieces. This is made easier with tribute doll and cost down, so he could tribute one monster instead of two for the guardian. He's more like a sign of things to come since he's the first opponent to have Dust Tornado, a card that destroys spell and trap cards. He also has Regeki Break, which pops one card on the field for the cost of one card in his hand. I fucked them up, but I started to see that a lot of my equips might not be a good idea to keep in a deck for much longer. Um, excuse me, what the actual fuck are you doing in my house? He's here to tell you that you qualify for the finals of the Beginner's Cup. Finally, this game is going somewhere. It took 83 duels to get here. 
Now that amount of duels will land you in the mid game range and past battle sim games. So at this point it's pretty obvious for me to deduce that they paced this game exactly like those games and that was the wrong call. Something more in between Worldwide Edition and Eternal Duelist Soul would have been a much happy medium for this game. Should have taken 40 duels max to get to this point. If you drop the game before this point, I really don't blame you at all. I have to say for those who drop the game, you're missing out. Because the real game starts now. Some people may have seizures triggered by the light flashes or patterns that appear in the next scene. Skip ahead of the video if you cannot look at images and colors flashing fast. It's the big day today, and we start off in the building where the next stage of the cup is being held. Duelists from all over are here in the halls and the rooms of the building. You're taken to an orientation where the rules of the finals are told. Instead of being best to one like it was out in the streets, we now have to play a best of three. This gives you the opportunity to side in tech cards for the matchup similar to how paper play tournaments are in real life. I like the fact that they put players in a competitive player's shoe and think about what cards would be good tech choices to have in a tournament. After the orientation, you're back in the hallway. You can either go straight into the mix of things or check the rooms out a bit. Duelists are lurking here and there, so if you want to do some last minute grinding, which you probably don't want to do after the 90 plus duels it took to get here, nah, that ain't it, y'all. You can also buy some cards at the shop. There was a new pack there for me to open up, and it's mostly Yu Gi and Dark Magician stuff. The Summon Skull and Gemini Elf was nice pickups at this point. Heavy Storm finally gives me the ability to remove back row, and Premature Burial is the first good revival card I got my hands on. My deck is now leaning towards dark monsters and cards that boost them. It follows the same idea of my Harpy deck in 04. Problem is, I can't get my hands on tomatoes yet. What I have now seems good enough though. The first match is with Joey and his deck is upgraded for the tournament. Game 1 goes by fast with me negating his summon with Horn of Heaven. I then proceed to go for game by summoning Stein, Meteor Black Dragon, and reviving summon Skull. Now it's off to the side deck. Game 2 starts and he flips up a new card in that deck that makes this duel so much more painful to play through. Fairy Box. When I attack, a coin is flipped. If called right, nothing happens. Called wrong and my card's attack changes to zero for that battle. He also has to pay 500 life points on his turns to keep the card though. Attacking with low level monsters is risky, but I could take that risk. I can't take that risk with Meteor Black Dragon though. He stalls long enough to equip Metal Morph to a card. With this, he can mirror the attack of a monster that the card attacks plus 300. He can run over my dragon, but he doesn't, because the card that's equipped with the metal card is Panther Warrior, a card that cannot attack unless you tribute another monster. The AI does not like the idea of paying costs for anything half the time. Once it was my turn, I played my own Metal Morph on my Mass Sorcerer to get around the Fairy Box and draw a card. I attack the Panther Warrior with my Sorcerer, but he plays Magical Arm Shield, which takes my Meteor Black Dragon and uses it as a shield. The tide shifted and now I'm under pressure. Fairy Box by itself made this duel so much worse. However, it's about to be my win condition. He has 1500 life points left. All I need to do from here is wait the game out and burn him for game with the germs. When a germ dies, not only do they summon two from the deck, but they also inflict 500 damage. If my germ can attack through, I win. If it dies, I win regardless because of the burn. I barely came out of this duel alive. Leaving a match, Joey gives you your flowers, but you can't enjoy them for long because the next match is starting up. The finals for the Beginner's Cup is Little Yugi. My match with him was a pretty simple and clean 2-0. It's the same deck with some small upgrades. Zumbira is the card of choice they gave him in order to fight off the beast sticks you've been collecting since the start. 2100 attack, which is higher than my Dark L. Its drawback is that it can't attack directly. 
The other card that now appears in his deck is Magic Cylinder, which can reverse my attack to my life points. This card is kinda scary because of my addiction to Cyberstein. One swing with Meteor Dragon can get me killed. I won the match with Yugi and now it's time for me to claim my... prize? Roland tries to look for the prize, but it turns out it's missing. Someone stole the prize under our noses, and it's up to us to find the thief. Isn't Kaiba a billionaire? Why not just replace the prize? Why does it have to be up to us to catch this bum? You get a save prompt at this point, which is nice. From this point on, you have to find the culprit, and the day won't end no matter how much time passes. You have to go around the map and get clues from NPCs about sketchy characters. Excuse me, have you seen anyone sus around here? Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. Fuck you, bitch! Shut the fuck up, bitch! Throughout the day, most of the NPCs don't have much to say. Eventually, I do get something about the thief having blonde hair, though. We meet up with Yugi and he tells us that we might have Swiper on our sites in the shopping district. We head over there and we see Joey and Mai. Joey starts to profile Mai because of her spotty past and the blonde hair tip. And she gets pissed at everyone. She runs off with Joey falling right behind her soon after to try and apologize for the profiling. On the way to talk to an NPC, Panic pops up out of nowhere and forces a shadow game. He has a zombie deck that tries to get an extra boost from Castle of Dark Illusions. This card will boost up his zombie cards every turn. Other than that, it's pretty similar to Bones and Bakura's deck. Wow, three zombie boys in one game. What sets Panic apart is the source of Concealing Light. Consider this card to be a pseudo board wipe. It takes your cards and forces them into face down defense position for two turns. Since my card's defense is eh, this can be a problem. I was thinking Panic was our guy, but it turns out he's just another goon roaming around. Yugi meets up with us again to see if any progress was made when we suddenly hear a scream. We head on over to the building in the middle of the map and find Joey on the verge of being laid out. This is where the cucking of Joey begins. Turns out, the person that laid them out is Bandit Keith, the same guy that got his shit pushed in by Joey in Duelist Kingdom. Why did they just decide to make Joey eat shit in this game is beyond me, especially from the person he beat in the last arc. Keith has enough cards that probably would have made him a problem at this point. Chaser's on deck, as expected, and with copies of Metal Morph and 7 complete the boosts machines, you'll be looking at a problem instant. He has copies of Time Machine, which can revive cards that died in the same turn he activated. Keith is one of the opponents to use removal like Fissure, so try not to have your strongest monsters out there half the time. He also has Scapegoats, which helps with stalling. The most dangerous card in his deck though is Limiter Removal. This card doubles the attack of all his machine cards, but they all self-destruct at the end of the turn. Blast Spear is probably the most annoying card in the deck. Swing at it and it equips to your monster card. On the next turn, it dies and you lose life points equal to the card's attack power. With all these cool additions to his deck, he has two major problems. One is the fact that he doesn't have Machine King. No idea why they didn't just give him Machine King over the other big ass cards in the deck. Especially since he has the issue of being top heavy as fuck. It's similar to the problem he had in Reshef of Destruction. Pendulum Machine, Slot Machine, Launcher Spider, Barrel Dragon, Zoa, Metal Zoa, you ain't going to do shit. I feel like they could have easily made his deck a DNA surgery gimmick deck with goats powering up Machine King. We press Keith to give back the stolen prize, but he just doesn't. What a goon. He says he only dueled us because we challenged him and bounced. Dork, dork, and dorky. We make sure Joey's okay and able to go home, and from there we go our separate ways. Crazy how we spent the entire day looking for this guy to just end up back home empty handy. We ain't found shit! The day starts and we're treated to a scene in Kaiba Mansion. Mokuba tells Kaiba that Yugi and pals couldn't secure the bag from the thief. Kaiba states he knew we would fail. Oh damn! And questions who would have the balls to do this in the first place. He then states that he'll do everything in his power to find a crook. Me. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! Um, excuse me, what the actual fuck are you doing in my house? I'm convinced the main character does not lock his door. The crazy part is barging in the place and asking if we're the right person in the first place. Hello? He points out that we gotta be mighty upset for what happened. So instead of just giving us the prize himself, the billionaire by the way, and leaving things to the proper authorities, he'd rather upgrade our dual disc 
to find a goon ourselves. This is all for the sake of my pride. My pride? Ain't nobody trying to hear that bullshit, oh. man. You let a goon with an American flag silky steal money from your million dollar tournament? I missed the part where that's my problem. Get hooked! Anyways, you now have the ability to see the duelist level of any opponent on the map before facing them. This should make it a lot easier to find Keith again. It's shown later that other characters also got the same update as well. So, the shit he gave me is not even unique. What was the point of the visit face to face if you wasn't giving me something unique? Let me also state that it took over 90 duels to get a function I feel like I should have had from the get go. As the day goes by, I find a high ranked duelist at night. It's gotta be Keith. I head over to the area and was greeted by Yugi and Joey, who also got the signal of a strong enemy in the area. It's Keith, and he's here to finish us off for good? The man himself, Pegasus, pops out from the shadows, and it turns out Keith was working for him. Which is kinda crazy, cause I'm pretty sure Pegasus got this man killed, but whatever. He proposes a duel to you, and if you win, you get to have everything back, much to the dismay of Bandit Keith. His deck is a bona fide tune deck, which is probably the first time he had a proper tune deck in a game, as far as I know. Toon Monsters are cards that can't be summoned unless Toon World is face up on the field. To activate Toon World, they have to pay 1000 life points. Toon cards all have summoning sickness when they hit the field and can't do anything till next turn. By then, they have the power to attack you directly. Their biggest weakness, besides the summon sickness, is Toon World itself. If Toon World leaves the field, all the Toon cards die with it. They were designed to be a high risk, high reward deck. But they ended up sucking way too much ass because the combination of both drawbacks. They wouldn't even be that crazy if you allowed them to attack the same turn they're summoned. Anyways, some of them can special summon themselves, giving the deck a bit of swarm power if he's lucky. Toon Dark Magician Girl requires a tribute as a cost to special summon it though. Because of this, he can actually use Scapegoat to special summon Dark Magician Girl. Normally, you can't use the goats to tribute summon a monster, but since this is for a special summon, is a legal play. He has Toon Table contents to search out any two card he needs. And Relinquish is his ace card. With Scapegoat in the deck, he's a few degrees away from Goat Control. He could use the Goat tokens to Ritual Summon Relinquish, and if he has Fusion Gate activated, he can summon Thousand Eye. Both of these cards have the effect to steal a card on the other side of the field and equip it to itself, and mimic its stats. If you try to destroy them in battle, they could protect themselves from dying by ditching the equip and you take the battle damage as well. Doing this guy made me realize that I should probably take out some of the cards that boost Dark Monsters. Because of Dark Monsters making up the majority of the card pool in Yu-Gi-Oh, I often accidentally boost their cards as well. For now, it didn't lose me any games, but I'm ready to use a different element ASAP. After the defeat, he just ups and disappears quickly. I'm just as confused as they are, he just up and dipped. Seems he kept his word though, cause he left the prize money and the cards behind. Before I can understand what I even got, Kaiba pops in. They ask him what the hell is going on, but he has no idea. But he'll do whatever he can to hunt them down to the ends of the earth. He tells us that he came here personally to tell us that tomorrow will be the start of the next step in the Kaiba Cup Pro Tour, the Expert Cup. We have to catch the local train in the area to head over to Tokyo for the announcement. Last thing is for Kaiba to berate Joey for being a scrub as usual. It wouldn't be a Yu-Gi-Oh game without Kaiba hazing Joey. Now I wanted to check the prizes and honestly I can't believe I fought so hard for this bullshit. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Long ago, Konami tried to make level up cards. These are cards that had the ability to level up and change to a different card if the conditions were met. Now, when you bought a copy of this game back in the day, you got three cards out the box. Magician Circle, Silent Magician Level 4, and Silent Magician Level 8. The prize cards you get in this game are the very same cards you just got in real life. Magic Circle is a card that summons a spellcaster straight out of the deck if you're attacking with a spellcaster card. This was usually a card used in rubber band spellcaster decks back in the day to cheese out Dark Magician Girl ASAP. It's an okay card, but it was pretty slow even by 2005 standards. You basically can't use this card until the next battle phase after you set it. Silent Magician level 4 gains a counter every time your opponent draws a card. It gains 500 for each one. Once it gains 5 counters, it can level up into Silent Magician level 8 by sending it to the graveyard and summoning level 8 out of the deck or hand. Now, level 8 is immune to spell card, and I'ma let you know right now, 
This shit sucks unbelievable amounts of ass. We talking straw in the booty hole sucking shit. It's literally cocoon of evolution if it was starving and they gave it a bone. No meat on it. Straight gnawing on nothing but hopes and dreams. It's insane to think that anything that takes 5 turns to be summoned would ever be good. It only gains counters on your opponent's draw, not yours. Cherry on top is that I only got 2 of these cards. You don't even get level 8 until later in the game, so even if you wanted to make a shitty ass gimmick deck around this, you can't. From this point on, I'm no longer counting the duels. The counter was to show how long it takes to get to the next story bit in a measurable way besides time. When you make it here, at this point of the game, it flows like butter. Every story event happens one after the other, and it makes me wonder why wasn't it like this for the first few hours of the game? If you drop the game before this point, again, I understand, but know that you're gonna get a serious case of FOMO from this point on. This is where the real game starts. Several duelists you fought in the past have their decks upgraded. Some become a lot more competent like Mako. His deck revolves around Legendary Ocean and trying to cheese out high level monsters for free. Right out the gate, you already know he has the classic tornado wall. Never seen a rubber band Umi deck without it. Mother Grizzly makes it easy for him to get water monsters he needs on the field. Legendary Fisherman is in the deck in all its glory, and it could be pretty annoying to deal with at this point, cause it has an immunity to magic card. But the biggest upgrade was the Abyss Soldiers in the deck. By discarding a water card, he could return a card back to the hand. And since he has Sinister Serpent in his deck, he could pretty much do this every turn when it's on the field since Serpent goes back to his hand next turn. The other guys get more of a speed boost in their decks, but overall the strategy doesn't change. Mako's first deck legit did not have Legendary Ocean, so this is more than just an upgrade. It's a brand new deck. Going back to the plot, you get a Battle City like announcement once you arrive and it kicks off from there. I head straight out and find someone with a high rank in the area. It's Ishizu. She wants to test your heart as a duelist. Now, usually Ishizu is a roadblock for me in these games half the time. However, in this game, she's terrible. She has a deck destruction deck in this game instead of her brother, which makes sense because her deck's goal in the anime is to deck out the opponent. She mills as many cards as she can from her own deck fast enough to use Reversal of Graves. This way she ends up with at least half a deck of cards left while the opponent might have 5 or less in the deck. The issue is that she doesn't have much to protect herself with. Half the time she's just taking an ass beating. She's probably the weakest opponent at this point of the game. After the duel, she senses a great potential in your spirit but says you're not quite there yet. Once you are though, she hopes to see you again. Later, I see Ishizu three more times in the day, and every time I beat her, she slowly leans more and more into thinking I'm at the potential. Saw her one last time, and now she's fully convinced that I have what it takes, and she says that she'll keep an eye out for me. Moving around at night, I spot Bakura. He asked if I was still dueling, and it seemed like he was about to chat it up, but then he just zoned out. Bakura's deck is a deck. And no, I don't mean by Yu-Gi-Oh game standards. You go from fighting with beaters like Mechanical Tracer to multiple copies of DD Assailant and Warrior Lady. Man's got Breaker in the deck. I think this is the first time I'm talking about such an iconic Yu-Gi-Oh card on this channel. That's crazy. I feel a bit silly explaining this card, but there's probably a good chunk of you that don't know much about Yu-Gi-Oh or Boomer cards. So here goes nothing. Breaker has the effect to gain a counter on his normal summon, and as long as it has that counter, it gains 300 attack power. He can remove that counter from Breaker to pop one of your back row cards. Whoa! This brother's on another level. I'm just trying to tell you something. This card is so good at this point that it's limited to one per deck at the time. I mentioned these two earlier, but these are different dimension cards. These cards have the ability to banish any card that they had combat with. Not only do these cards have good attack values, they also can virtually kill almost any card in the game no matter how strong. Anyone who played Yu-Gi-Oh competitively knows who the fuck Kaiko is. A spellcaster with a high attack value and an effect to remove two monsters in your graveyard if it inflicts damage. If there was a card you plan on reviving, say goodbye to it for good. 
He has three copies of Giant Germ and Mystic Tomatoes, both cards being tutors he can use to stall for time and search for key cards. Night Assailant destroys one of your cards when flipped face up. Wall of Illusion, as you know, returns a card that attacks it, and he has three copies of both, so you know your cards are being tossed left and right constantly. And the cherry on top? For some fucking reason, they decided to give him Spell Canceler. Jinzo, but for magic cards. No one can activate them, and the effects of the ones on the field are negated. My deck, no, scratch that. Every card I own at this point is nowhere near the power level of his deck. I'd kill to have Breaker in my deck, what the fuck? Now his deck can already beat you into the Shadow Realm, but what if I told you he had an alternate win con? That's right, Destiny Board. By flipping up the trap card every standby phase, he gets a spirit board piece from the deck. If all five slots are filled with these cards, he automatically wins. Now in paper play, this shit is ass. Most people have spell and trap removal to prevent garbage like this. However, in this game, that is not the case. I still only have Heavy Storm, one card out of 40. If the countdown happens, I have to hope I draw this card out of 30 or less cards. You have to understand that getting spell trap removal in this game is a nightmare. No pun intended. Dust Tornado is a common in one of the packs, and I never got it for some reason. Mind you, I think I got that pack 20 to 30 times overall in my playthrough. MST is an ultra rare in this game, in a pack that's available around the time the Expert Cup happens, which is damn near in-game. Understand that I spam the pack that MST is in to make my in-game deck, and by the time I beat the game, I still didn't have the card. He has this cat that he uses to search out trap cards too, so it's no problem for him to get it fast. My duel with him was nerve wracking. He ended up with four letters, but one card stuck in the back row. Thank God. I swung with one of my monsters and it was a DD card, but I can handle losing a card because I have four monsters left. And I already know he doesn't have Mirror Force prior, so I'm in the... I can't believe that I lost. And the worst part is that I have to do the whole day all over again. Meaning I have to see Ishizu four times again. I got back to Bakura and got my revenge, but the mental and temporal damage has already been done. Oh, the next day I woke up to an email saying that I got enough wins under my belt to be in the finals. Wow, this game is moving so much faster now. Oh my God. You're supposed to use this day to prepare so I ended up fighting Mai seven times in the day. She has a tried and true Harpy deck and it's pretty similar to the deck I had in 04. Birdface to search for Harpies, Egotist to summon Harpy Lady Sisters, the Wind Bug to summon Wind Monsters from the deck on Destruction. The difference comes from some of the additions of the cards that came out well past the release of 04. She has multiple copies of both DD cards and she has copies of Gemini Elf. Harpy's Hunting Ground is a new card at this point that's a field spell. If she plays a Harpy while it's face up, she gets to pop one of your spell and trap cards. It also boosts the birds by 200 points. The most annoying card in her deck is Mirror Wall. This card will half the attack of your attacking monsters, but she has to pay life points to keep the card on the field on her turns. I tend to turtle and pace myself a lot in these duels now because they have cards that can just shut down my plans with Cyberstein. It still works, but only at the right time instead of any time. The duels are a lot more engaging at this point of the game and the pace is so much better. Opponents having cards like Snatch Steel and Mirror Force on a regular means that you have to start playing more smart. It's time to claim the cup for myself. I head off to the building where they wanted you to be and nothing. I legit can't get inside. I kept traveling back and forth between, but nothing. I check my mail just in case if I misread, but nope, it says me here. What gives? Well, it turns out you're supposed to wait till night to go in. You told me the date without the time. Thanks, Kaiba Corp. Roland leads us into the mansion where you meet up with some of the other finalists. There we see Yugi and Joey also made the finals. Seems like we're the only ones so far, but it doesn't matter. The others can catch up. Roland is about to introduce Kaiba, but Mokuba has some words to share. Mokuba greets us and says his plans are ready. Huh? huh? Seems normal till Kaiba shows up and he's confused too. That's not Mokuba. It's Noah. 
Noah Kaiba. This is a filler villain, so if you didn't watch the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime, I might as well give you a brief summary. He is the biological son of Seto and Mokuba's stepdad, Gozaburo Kaiba. Noah was supposed to be the next person to take up the mantle of Kaiba Court. A car accident left Noah critically injured and on his deathbed. As a way to save his heir, Gozaburo uploaded Noah's mind into a supercomputer. With this aura, I mean Noah was no longer restricted by the physical world and can now do much more than ever. Problem is, he had no other human interactions, which pretty much stunted his growth, just like the average person on the internet. Noah was never able to mature and because of that, Gozaburo gave up on him and adopted the Kyber brothers we know today. Gross brief summary of the situation, but it's enough to catch you up. Noah starts to taunt Kaiba with the fact that he kidnapped Mokuba and we gotta start playing his game or else. Noah has several goons out and about in the world and if we beat them, we win the game. However, if we lose, he'll set the world ablaze. Puzzled by how he can do that, he starts to explain that Kaiba Corp in the past used to be an arms dealer. Kyber Corp's mission was to sell weapons on a global scale and manipulate the government powers in the shadows. Kaiba starts to explain that even if he knew that, he destroyed all traces of the company's past works and dealing. Unfortunately, there was one weapon he missed, a satellite cannon. And with that, no one can wipe out any city as he pleases. So the rat race has begun. We head outside and we see the world is so fucked. So here's how this works. You gotta find several of Noah's goons out in the world before the day ends. You have to beat four of them in a row without saving. So lose to one of them and you have to start this all over. They're all 5 star opponents, so you can easily find them. Now keep in mind these guys are no pushovers. If Bakura wasn't the one to make you change your deck to be more consistent, these guys will do it. Problem is, there isn't that many cards at this point that can help with that. I had to get my card advantage in the most getaways possible with Mass Sorcerer and Giant Germs. Now from this point on, two more magic cards are added to the pool of cards most opponents will use from now on. The Link with Duo is an infamous card in Yu-Gi-Oh where you pay 1000 life points to activate its effect. It rips one random card from the opponent's hand and then the opponent chooses the other card to discard. This card is limited but with cards like Magician of Faith, you can see this happening multiple times in a duel. Mystical Space Typhoon is the other card most opponents will start to have. If your deck relied on cards like Fuel Spells, Equips, Perma Spells, Perma Traps, it's best to keep in mind that you won't be getting away with murder for much longer. Big One is an upgraded version of Mako's deck. Oh, word for word, shit. bar for bar! Everything Mako has, he has it, including the Fisherman. They gave him copies of Penguin Soldier and Wall of Illusion to bounce back your cards. Revival Jam is something he summons after Mother Grizzly dies. If it dies in battle, he can choose to revive it next turn for a thousand life point. Thousand is way too steep. He'll pay it though, which is a first for the AI. With Revival Jam and combination of Legendary Ocean, it makes it a lot easier for him to summon Suijin. With the Water God's effect to decrease the attack of a monster to zero, it makes it really difficult to out this monster with another monster. You have to kill it with a magic or a monster effect. Tribe Infecting Virus Discard a card from the hand and declare a type. All cards that share that type are destroyed. This was the earliest version of Judgment Dragon back in the day. Also, I used to think the guys in the card were the monsters, but they're actually the dudes getting filtered by the virus. The virus apparently looks like this. Oh my god! What is that? Big 2 also has a legendary ocean deck? How original. Brother, that's like 3 zombie users and 3 water users. <laughs> this really is Playground Yu-Gi-Oh. So take everything the last guy had and add Catapult Turtle to the mix. This can tribute cards on his field to burn you for damage equal to half the attack power of the sacrifice card. His goal is to cheese this card out using the effect of the ocean or mother grizzly and start burning you for damage. What makes him extremely annoying is that his deck incorporates good old rubber band ocean strats, gravity bind, and level limit area beat. Daring today, aren't we? These are floodgates that prevent level 4 and higher cards from attacking. With the ocean making his level 4 water monsters level 3, he doesn't care about this. He can attack still. He has copies of cold wave to prevent you from using spells and traps to destroy the floodgates. Now I washed him before he did any of his bullshit. But looking at his deck list made me realize 
I was very lucky. Number three has a very interesting deck, and I was not expecting a return deck. Return from a different dimension is a card that costs half your life points to special summon as many banished monsters you own back to the field. They are banished towards the end of that turn though. The idea is to use cards that remove cards from play as soon as possible so return could be very active. First, let me say that his monsters are insane. Multiple beat stick monsters that I can barely keep up with. The worst one being Slate Ward. I hate this card in every single old school Yu-Gi-Oh game because it beats whatever beat sticks you have most of the time. Not to mention the fact that it weakens the monster that kills it. You never really have that many cards to avoid trading with it till near the end of these games. Banisher of Light banishes cards sent to the graveyard as long as it's face up. Decent card to use for his return combo, but it's way too slow for the most part. The real star is the Thunder Dragon. By pitching one Thunder Dragon, you could grab two more from the deck. Afterwards, he could use the field spell Fusion Gate. This card allows players to fuse without polymerization. From there, he summons Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. Basically, this card makes the duel forbidden memories. Now, the drawback to Fusion Gate is that the fusion materials are removed. However, with Return, he could summon the two dragons back and refuse them for another Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. This is the most rubber band return deck I've ever seen. He pulled this off too, but I managed to smoke the dragon with my dragon. I risked a lot to do that because I was left with a thousand life points. What the hell is this? Minor Goblin official? You can only activate this card when your opponent's life points are 3000 or less. Inflict 500 points of damage to your opponents ain't no fucking way. Every standby phase, he has one set card. I have a card with 3500 attack and another with 1400. The issue is that the face down card could be Banisher of Light or any other high defense monster he has. I can't attack with Dark Elf because I don't have the life points to pay to attack with them. I could tribute the Stein for summon Skull, but he has 4700 life points left, so I can't finish the game that way. I'm stuck with the Witch's Apprentice. This is a card that boosts the power of dark monsters by 500. So she rises up to 1050, and Stein goes up to 1900. It helps with doing enough damage to end the game, but that can't happen if the face down card has high defense. I was so fucked, and when I finally attacked with the witch, all that sweating for nothing. Big 4 is the weakest of the 5. His deck is just a mashup of machine monsters, and I don't have much to say about him. Can't even call it a rubber band deck, it's a billy deck. Now once you beat all four of them, the game gives you the option to save. Thank God. Now in a way, if you're not ready for everything that happens after, you can potentially soft lock yourself. I highly doubt that happened to anybody, but saving mid gauntlet like this brings me back to a lot of older games that soft lock people this way. Next opponent after the save is the big five. And this guy, you full of shit, you understand that? You full of shit. This is Shining Angel. Once this dies, this summons Satellite Cannon. This card cannot be destroyed by cards level 7 or below. Also, at the end of each of his turns, it gains a thousand attack. However, if it attacks, its attack power goes down to zero. The issue is not the attack gaining. It could be a problem, but the real issue is not being able to kill with lower level cards. You have to understand that most cards that are level 8 or higher at this time were dog shit. The only one people play competitively at this point was Black Luster Soldier, the best card in the format. Not to mention, it's very easy to summon, so killing it by battle is out of the question. So what about card destruction? Well, at this point in the game, I had one copy of Fissure, Lightning Vortex, Share the Pain, That's all, folks. either card destruction in general is scarce in this game, or my luck getting card removal was just terrible. The rest of his deck are some of the better cards in Yu-Gi-Oh at the time. DD Warrior Lady and Cyberjar. My good old friend Cyberjar. The card that flips face up, blows everything up on the field, and both of you take five cards and see if you can summon any of them and keep the rest. Fucking stupid. Copycat being annoying for me specifically because of the potential of him copying my fusion card stats. Fairy Injection Lily can almost kill any card in the game for the cost of 2,000 life points. This card is a problem the same way the cannon is. I don't have much monster removal. So once this card hits the field, it's a stalemate. 
With a flurry of the best magic cards in the game, games with him with the card pool available at this point will always be challenging. The biggest star of the deck is Jinzo and Royal Decree. Expect your trap cards to be more than likely dead cards in the deck against this guy. I lost twice to him. The first game was lost to a stalemate with Reflect Bounder equipped with United We Stand, which boosts the card's attack by 800 for each monster on their side of the field. When I finally drew Mirror Force, which would have got me out of the situation, and I scooped. The third game was looking bleak right from the get-go. I did my Stein combo, but he played Lightning Vortex and wiped my board. When I finally got some momentum back, I swung at a Magician of Faith, which gave him back the Vortex to do it again. Eventually, I get an equip card to equip to Lejin and run over his Air Knight, thus winning the game. The games with him were a clear sign that it was high time to make a different deck once this is all over. After the dust settles, a mind control Mokuba pops up in the scene and drags you towards an abandoned military base. The only way to get Mokuba back to normal at this point is to beat him in a duel. What was your point in coming, nigga? Anyways, the mind control is dropped and the scene moves to Noah and Kaiba wrapping up. Kaiba lost to Noah and he's just about ready to set the world on fire until we step in. Noah decides to give the world one more chance and making you bet everything on a duel with him. If you're familiar with the anime, you'll be privy to the idea of his deck revolving around Shinato. Shinato is a ritual monster that inflicts damage to your life points equal to the attack of the monster it destroyed in defense. In order to get to it fast, he has cards like Manju to grab the Ark and Shinato ASAP. He has fulfillment of the contract. This is to get Shinato back if it dies somehow. Other than that goal, the rest of his deck is just a bunch of decent fairy cards and solid magic and trap cards. I think he's easier to beat than the big five because his hand has the possibility to go dead half the time. Even when he summoned Shinato on me, I was able to get it off the field and sweep him up. Afterwards, he's shocked that he lost and Mokuba tries to get everyone to calm down. The summary I gave earlier is the summary that Mokuba pretty much tells everyone present in the game. Noah then collects himself and keeps his word to let us out. But at the same time, Noah starts to hint the fact that this may be the last time we see him because he's planning to blow up the base after we leave. Confused by why he would do that, we won't get an answer to that because we are met with the arrival of Gozaburo Kaiba. It turns out when Kaiba took everything from his father, he uploaded his mind to the same computer and plotted his revenge for years. Gozaburo plans to keep everyone here to die in the explosion. Kaiba tries to stop him, but he somehow took some serious injuries in the duel with Noah. So instead, the old man challenges us to a duel, and we only have 20 turns to beat him. Five minutes. Exodia Necros is the card his deck revolves around. By having all five pieces of Exodia in the graveyard, he can activate Contract of Exodia to special summon it from his hand. Why is it only his hand and not from the deck as well? What the fuck? This card is so bad? Exodia Necros cannot be destroyed by battle. It also cannot be destroyed by magic and trap cards but it can be destroyed by monster effects? What does so a measly man-eater bug can kill it? Why is Konami so scared to make a decent card? It also dies if any piece of Exodia is removed from the graveyard. He has a lot of powerful cards in the deck, but it's held back by how bad Exodia Necros is. The real challenge comes from beating him before 20 turns pass. I feel like it would have been fine to make his deck have multiple copies of banned and limited cards to make the deck viable enough to be problematic. After I beat the dog shit out of him, Noah stalls goes Gozaburo for us and thanks us for everything. The next scene is the main character waking up hearing an explosion in the distance. Apparently we were hooked up to a virtual reality world without even knowing it? You can barely remember what happened but there's a card in your hand. Noah gave you his copy of Shinata. This is the only way to get this card and the ritual by the way. Suddenly we get a scene of the Paradox Brothers. It turns out the last thing they remember was training in China and after that it's all a blank. Somewhere else Pegasus also starts to awaken and he's saying that he must have been mind control the whole time. It turns out that Noah at the start of the game did something at Kaiba Corp and was able to mind control multiple duelist kingdom villains. How? Who knows? Right after this realization, it's come to our attention that the finals are about to happen right now. 
Damn, can't even catch a break, huh? The pacing is crazy. And now you're inside the building that's holding the finals. The building here is similar to the one at the Beginner Cup. Several rooms hold duelists waiting around to watch the finals, and there's a shot to buy some cards. Speaking of cards, the pack mostly revolves around Battle City villain cards, such as Revival Jam, Force Raider, Dark Necrofear, and more. I spammed this pack to make the deck I have now. Keep in mind, this is the pack that has MST. I got this pack like 30 times and I didn't get a single one. Gilgarf and several Lajins are now in the deck for being fiends. Solid 1800 beaters along with a single copy of Vorse Raider just to be safe and have 5 low level cards I can rely on for attacking. Summon Skull because it's a solid monster and it's also a fiend. Jinzo to shut down trap cards. Cyberstein for the fusion combo with Last Will. And with the new fiend card I have, the combo is a lot easier to do. Nuvia the Wicked is a card that destroys itself if I normal summon it. With that, I can activate Last Will right after and get myself Meteor Black Dragon. Sengen is one of the new cards in the pack that can search out my combo pieces or monster removal. My monster removal on top of Wall of Illusions now is Nudoria. If Nudoria dies in battle, I can choose one card they own and destroy it. I also had a copy of Night Assailant, which also destroys one monster on the field when flip face up. The biggest star of the show is the two Dark Necro Fears. By removing three fiends from the graveyard, I can special summon it. If she dies at the end of the phase, I can equip her to a monster they have and take control of it. With Giant Germ in the deck, it's very easy to get three fiends in the graveyard. And with two copies of Foolish Burial, it makes it so much easier to turbo into her faster. A deck like this in paper play is doo doo, but the fun of these games is making gimmicky stuff like this and making it work for the game. With this deck, I'm ready to take on the end game. The girl that tried to get her blue eyes back from Yugi. Since Keith is out of the picture, she's now the USA champion, and now she's here to prove NA's worth. The rules are the same as the beginner cup. Matches are best of three with siding, and it's time to win it all. Game one starts with me playing duo discarding two cards from her hand. Because of the last few duels that I had with her, I just decided to summon Stein off rip and summon Meteor Black Dragon. In my duels with her, she never did anything about this. She always folds immediately after. I sent Nuvia and swung with my Meteor. Throughout my matches with her, I realized Stein might be the worst card to have against her because she has a Flame Princess stall deck. The deck is based on Flame Princess. Her effect is to inflict direct damage each time the owner recovers life points. To do this without any interruption, she will use floodgates like Gravity Bind and Level Limit Area B to stop level 4 and higher cards from attacking. She has multiple cards that help her recover life points for the win condition. I almost lost to her burn strat on multiple occasions. Although it was a bit my fault this time, other times in the future, it's just because of the lack of spell and trap removal. This game is being really cheap about giving me any type of removal when the late game opponents have some of the most obnoxious strategies around perma spells and traps. I win my two games and kick this crybaby out of the tournament. In this cup, instead of going straight to the next match, we get to see other people duel. The duelist you get to watch in the next match is Joey and Bakura. Yami Bakura somehow made it to the finals and is now putting Joey through a shadow game. It's really cool to just sit on the sidelines and watch a game play out with the two. You also get a preview of their Expert Cup decks too. Joey is sporting cards he didn't have before, but from this duel you can also see that Bakura ditched the whole spirit board in exchange for more generic good cards. Don't tell me, the foundation of his deck looks a lot like mine's. I need Joey to win this so bad because the last thing I expected to do in a Yu-Gi-Oh game is play a mirror match. I am having a very bad day! I guess this is their way of imitating the anime where he lost to Merrick and got sent to the shadows. I remain with the stance that I'd rather play as Joey so I don't have to see him get done dirty over and over in these games. Now I gotta face off against Bakura and get Joey's soul back in a mirror match. And Bakura is so fucking cracked. His deck shares the same ideas of my deck. Night Assailants and Wall of Illusion for removal, Giant Germ to Turbo Necro Fear, High Attack 4 Star Fiends, Staple Magic and Trap Cards. However, his version is a lot better than mine's by a mile. See, remember the guy with the Thunder Dragon Return deck? Bakura 
has a Necro Fear Return deck. He will flip return to get several of his fiends back. And with copies of Mask of Darkness, he could grab the return back from the graveyard. The real kicker isn't the return card. See, return decks play return. But to be a real return deck, you also need Dimension Fusion. And he has several copies of this card. By paying 2,000 life points, both players can special summon banished cards they own. This technically helps me in the mirror, but there have been times where he played it while I didn't have much removed yet. And with spell absorption, he recovers the life he pays for throughout the duel every time a spell is activated. I lost 1-2 to two because of the place with Dimension Fusion, his trap cards, and Dark Necro Fear. See, normally Dark Necro Fear isn't that scary because you can simply destroy it with MST when it's equipped to one of your cards to get control of your card back. But again, all I got from the game was Heavy Storm and Giant Trunade. And Giant Trunade is the worst card to get rid of it because that means he could just summon it again. Normally, this duel's a challenge, but because of my pulls, it was a nightmare. I got my rematch in two of them in some close ass duels. He laughs it off and concedes this time. With that, Joey wakes up from the Shadow Realm. After the small celebration, Yugi heads off to face Kaiba in the semifinals, and man, was this duel tight to watch. This game is really starting to shine and show that it's probably the best Duel Monsters ever game. Challenging duels, a good card pool, nice variety of decks, even though there were three different water duelists and zombie duelists, and a tight story to follow. All the ingredients to make a decent game is here, but it takes about 90 duels to get to this point. This game doesn't turn up until like 5-6 hours into it. That's a hard sell for anyone to play this game all the way through. Kaiba ends up losing and admits defeat to Yugi, which is a rare sight to see. I was wrong, Mokuba. He is the king of games. And now it's time for the grand finals to see who's the king of games. Honestly, I pushed the shit in. I lost the first game because he got Demok on the field and swung at my Stein. Oops. But the next two games, I swept them up. I had a little trouble with Skull Archfiend. It can negate card effects that target it if you get the right die result. This card has more protection than Exodia Necros, what the fuck? He has good cards in the deck like Snatch Steel and DD Warrior Lady, but he probably would have been stronger if they made his deck focus around Dark Magician more than this potluck of cards. And that's the end of Expert Cup. With everything wrapped up, we obtained our prize. You will now have Silent Magician level 8 along with some other goodies. Everybody celebrates and we head off home. Once you get home, you get some mail saying that you can now use the password machine. Wow, I almost forgot about that. Almost two hours into the video and I can finally talk about the password machine. With the password machine unlocked, I can finally work on making a deck I want to make. The Harbury deck that I made in 2004. With the new packs too, I could get floaters like Mystic Tomato and the Wind Bug. I got some Magician of Faiths too, and now my deck feels a lot more complete. The issue now is that the password system has a rule where you can only get cards you already own in the game. It also costs a thousand points to get a card from it. What kind of shit is that? Guess that's their way of stopping players from just porting over their whole deck. Now, from this point on, it's hard to have an idea of what the goal is in the game now. But for some reason, weak duelists are popping up in the new city, which isn't weird because they are always there, but they're the only ones showing up. I read from a comment that there was a glitch that can remove higher level duelists from the area before the Expert Cup, but this is after, so this is something else. I went back to the old town and noticed that there were high level duelists in that area instead. What gives? So it turns out, this is the game's way of forcing you to look around the starting area for Ishizu. Because for some reason, she's in the starting area instead of the second area. Why not just have her in the second town? I don't know. I can only imagine how many players got lost at this point. When you find Ishizu, she asks what kind of power you desire. Seems obvious that your answer determines which god card you end up having at some point. When you answer, she says that she knew what you were going to say and that someone else is also qualified for the test. Duel Monsters is based upon- Who cares? Kaiba is the other person who qualified. Your character is kind of confused on what's going on, but they're up for the challenge. This is a classic Kaiba deck if I've ever seen one. 
La Jin, Vorse Raider, Slate Warrior, DD Warrior Lady, and a majority of the best spell and trap cards in the game. He even has Raigeki in this deck. You see, after the Expert Cup, from now on, every opponent has one banned card in their deck. This takes the game up a notch for sure. You're also able to use a banned card as well. My banned card of choice was Wicked Witch of the Force. With this, I could search for Genzo just like the good old days. Ancient Lap is an annoying card for sure. If you attack it while it's face down, it redirects the attack to one of your other monsters. The combination of this card and the DD cards will make you second guess yourself about attacking. It also has the effect of special summon La Jin from his hand, making it easier for him to tribute them for his iconic blue eyes. He also has cards like Gilosaurus to put more bodies on the board to tribute summon for blue eyes easier. Kaiba also has the ability to stall the game out with Spirit Reapers. They can't be destroyed by battle, but if they're targeted by any card effect, they die immediately. He also stalls the game out with Fiend Sanctuary. It summons a token with zero stats to his field, and any damage he would take from the battle will be inflicted to you instead. He has to pay a thousand life points to keep the card on his side of the field though. The token and various cards in his deck are prime targets for his ultimate trap card. I think you need to be taught a lesson. Crush Card Virus. He offers one dark monster with a thousand attack or less to destroy all of your monsters that have 1500 attack or higher on the field and in your hand. And for the next three turns, Kaiba is just cock watching you. Any card you draw with high attack is cooked. Kaiba is strong, but he gets dead hands often because of the blue eyes. Blue eyes causing bricks since 2001. After the duel, Kaiba is pissed at us and Ishizu declares that Destiny has chosen me to have Obelisk. She tells you after handing the god card to you that she also gave one to Yugi. The plan was for one of us to come find the thief who stole the winged dragon of Raw. If you find Yugi later in the next day, not only is he surprised to see that you have a god card, but he also warns you about the rare hunters going around stealing rare cards from duelists in the area. They're aiming to find the owners of the god cards right now. So now you have an objective. Beat some goons and find a thief. From now on at night, rare hunters have a chance to spawn to duel you. Sometimes multiple times in the same night. Now in my case, I only fought Loomis, Umbra, and Strings. They all have troublesome decks, especially since all of them have banned cards in their deck. But if you're able to handle the opponents in the Expert Cup and the Big Five, you can beat these guys too. You don't even need to duel most of them to progress the game apparently. Only one of them progressed the story. Over one of the later days, you run into Namu. Namu here introduces himself as a novice duelist that's new to the area and starts riding your dick like crazy. Look at this shit. An amateur like me can't take a single life point from you? Get off that nigga dick, bro. What is you doing? Even the main character thinks this whole interaction was weird. It's just way too much dick riding going on. Later on in the day, I was leaving a duel with Yugi when one of the rare hunters appeared. But not just any rare hunter. This is the one that's needed to progress the game. And I'm not gonna lie. That shit stinks! He's super ass. Like high key, his deck is worse than Mokubus, I swear to god. No idea why they didn't make him cheat like he does in the other games. What? He runs away after the duel, with Yugi catching up to us. Serenity also appears soon after, and she asks if we've seen Joey anywhere. And it seems like they got the Joey. In the middle of trying to collect ourselves, the Rare Hunter comes back, but something's off. It turns out that it's Merrick brainwashing the Gooner. He tells Yugi that he plans to get revenge on him, and Yugi is just kind of dumbfounded by this because he has no idea who Merrick is. Yugi presses Merrick on his whereabouts, but Merrick says we got bigger things to worry about, hinting at the fact that something indeed has happened to Joey. The hunter goes unconscious and leaves us with not much information to go on about Joey's whereabouts. Even so, we promise Serenity we'll find him. The next day you'll find Joey at the pier, but something seems different. It turns out not only has he been caught, but he got brainwashed by Mary. You're then challenged to a shadow game by Joey. I won't talk about his deck just about yet. When you win, he seems like he is slowly turning back to normal, but suddenly he goes right back to being the goon again. Yugi ran over sensing a shadow game and finds out that Joey was the one that started it. Later on in the day, it's revealed that Taya has been missing for a while as well. After hearing the news, she soon pops up and forces you into a shadow game. Number three on the list, you! Number two, you! You ass! 
Unlike Joey, she's able to brush off the mind control after defeat. It seems the hold Merrick has over Joey is much more powerful if a duel can't even knock him out of it. The night of the same day we told Taya not to go out at night, she goes out against our wishes and finds someone suspicious at a corner. I am Merrick. I should disqualify you right now, but you have Egyptian god card. It's Merrick. They press him about Joey, but he's not willing to tell us shit and he forces us into a shadow game. Odeon, I mean Merrick, has a deck focused around trap cards as usual. In the past games, the majority of his deck would be trap cards, which left him to getting his back blown out by Genzo and Royal Decree. In this game, that is not the case. With the different dimension cards, he now has an answer to Genzo. On top of those two, he has Exile Force. This is a card that contributes itself to destroy one monster on the field. Night Assailant is in the deck too to destroy monster cards, so he has four monsters that destroy your monsters. He has Spirit Reapers and Sugar Babies to stall like crazy. This card summons two Sugar Babies from the deck, and he gains a thousand life points for each one that dies. He has all these cards to stall, so he could tribute them to summon Mystical Beast Circuit. It's a strong monster that gains 500 for each kill. The real star of the show in his deck is Cathedral of Nobles. See, he can't summon that Fairy Scorpion without the Perma Magic card. The first effect of this card is that he can activate trap cards the same turn he sets them. That is an absolutely insane effect because he can basically take a card like Jar of Greed, activate it the same turn instead of waiting, and this effectively turns his jars into upstarts. Dust Tornado is now just MST but purple with nobles in play. The second effect of the card is a bit nutty, but situational. If he has Surskit on the field, he can basically trade the Surskit for any monster in the deck, hand, or field. He does this to combo into Master of Oz, one of the weirdest fusion monsters in the game at the time. Why does it have 4200 attack? <laughs> now, Oyon's monster lineup is solid, but his trap lineup for the first time in these games is garbage. No Sakuretsu armor, no mirror force, no ring of destruction, no widespread ruin, or just anything that's dangerous. He was so close to having a good deck, but they somehow fumbled the core of his deck. The traps. He's still a bit of a challenge with everything else, but it sucks that they missed the mark, especially when compared to how cracked some of the past opponents were. When you beat Odeon, he knocks out, with his last few words being that the dark side will awaken. Master Merrick has a darker side, and I am unable to contain it anymore. Ishizu then pops up along with Mokuba. Mokuba saw what went down and had the ambulance come to take Odeon to safety. The group, visibly confused on what's going on, is told by Ishizu that that man is not actually Merrick, it's Odeon. Someone who serves the Ishtar family. In other words, Merrick's servant. Namu then pops in and sees that Odeon lost to us and he loses control. Yami Merrick is the split personality of Merrick that was created from the pain he endured as a tomb keeper. This side of Merrick revealed himself for the first time when Odeon was taking a brutal beating as a punishment for not preventing the Ishtar siblings from seeing the outside world. Yami Merrick does not care about anything but inflicting pain and destruction to everyone around him. A lot more is explained in that cutscene, but we have to come back to that later, because throughout all this nonsense that happened, Joey is still missing. Where they at, though? Even other duelists in the area would comment that Joey is missing, which is a lead for the player to find Joey first before dealing with Mary. On the next day, I was able to find Joey on the pier again. You're ready to duel him, but he makes the claim that Joey won't make it out of the shadow game alive if you beat him in a duel. Frustrated with the news, you back off for now. Later on, Yugi pops up and you explain the situation to him. Yugi confirms that Joey would be lost to the shadows if he loses a duel to us. However, if neither player wins the duel, oh, you motherfuckers. <laughs> the plan is now to get Joey back to normal by forcing a draw. To do this, Yugi gives you self-destruct button and ring of destruction. Self-destruct button is a card that forces the game to be a draw immediately. This card can only be activated if there's a 7,000 life point difference. That condition sounds difficult, but it's actually very easy to force. With a card like Wall of Light, you can fulfill this condition easily. Wall of Light lets you pay any amount of life points, and the monsters with less attack than the life points spent can attack. You could also probably find some way to use the button with cards that pay hefty amounts of life points like Cyberstein and Solemn Judgment. 
The other card is Ring of Destruction, which destroys one monster and inflicts damage to both you and the opponent equal to the attack of the destroyed card. This card was another cornball card that forced draws a lot, but this one didn't need a specific combo to do it, which made draws a lot more common. It's limited to one at this point of Yu-Gi-Oh for a reason. In the future, they changed the text of the card to make it so that it inflicts the damage to you first and then the opponent. That way, it can't force a draw game with the effect damage and instead makes you lose first if you're in kill range. The ring is perfect for my deck. Now with these cards, I go out to find Joey with the newfound goal to force our duel to a draw. His deck at this point in the game is a mix of his dice rolling mini games and some of the better warrior monsters in the game. He has both warrior lady and assailant in his deck. These two cards have been in almost every deck mid to late game, which might be a damper on the creativity. However, I'd much rather have these two cards over the garbage they did in World Championship 2004, which was giving everyone mid to late game Vorse Raider and Slate Warrior. The Captain Special summons another warrior in hand when he summons to the field. It also has the effect to prevent you from attacking other warrior monsters besides him. If he ends up with two captains on the field, you can't attack at all. Goblin Attack Force and Zombria are his beast sticks of choice now. He still has all the other dumb gambling cards in his deck, but they also gave him a new casino card. And this one is one of the best Yu-Gi-Oh cards ever. Six cents. Choose two numbers from one to six. Your opponent then rolls a die. If the number rolled matches one of your chosen numbers, you draw that many cards. If the number roll does not match one of the chosen numbers, send that many cards from the deck to the graveyard. This card is insane because it can basically give you a whole new hand if you declare five or six. If you call it wrong, you get to send five to six cards from your deck to the graveyard. This mill is supposed to be the drawback, but it ends up being a plus as well. The graveyard is pretty much the second resource in Yu-Gi-Oh besides the hand. There are so many cards that have effects related to the graveyard. In my case, I can use a card like this to make it much easier for me to summon Dark Necrofear by removing any fiends that got sent to the graveyard by six cents. They printed this card in the TCG only for it to be banned almost immediately. Side note, of all the formats to print this card, it had to be in a format where the most powerful deck revolved around using the graveyard as a resource, by the way. Now normally, you don't have to worry about him activating this card because he only has one. But in a duel where I have to wait and draw the ring, it'll probably pop up. And when it happens, be ready for it. Because the whole duel can literally flip in his direction. Even though he was able to pull off six cents, I was able to get the draw and snap Joey out of it. He has no idea what's been going on. The last thing he was doing was dueling a rare hunter, which was probably Merrick, and after that, it's all a blur. The welcome bags don't last for long though, because Merrick appears. He starts to talk shit to us and then goes to play hide and seek. This is the end game now. You have to find Merrick somewhere on the map and bring all of this to an end once and for all. Merrick's deck is focused around summoning the winged dragon of Raw. This version of Raw is not as ass as the TCG version. It has way too many effects, so I'm not going to explain them all, but just know that if it's on the field, you lost. Game over, man. Game over. He has several cards that either summon other monsters, special summon themselves, or revive itself upon destruction. Multiple beater monsters that are fiends. No different dimension cards to worry about from him, but he has Nudoria instead. Spirit Reaper helps him stall for raw, and does a bit of hand destruction for him to stay in theme with the hand and deck destruction from his past appearances. Lava Golem is probably what he's best known for. He could summon this to your side of the field by sacrificing two of your monsters. You lose two monsters and you gain one, which is already bad enough. Now you might be thinking that him giving you a 3000 attack monster is an upside, but he'll usually use a card like Nightmare Wheel to prevent the Golem from attacking. You also lose a thousand life points for each turn you have the golem, and if it's on the wheel, you lose 1500. Funny that Lava Golem is still one of the better monster removal cards to this day. On top of having some of the best magic cards in the game in his deck, he also has Soul Exchange. This card allows him to sacrifice one of your monsters instead of one of his. 
So if he uses this to try and summon Raw, he could use one of your cards and two of his instead of three of his cards. Merrick also has a slew of trap cards that either cause destruction or torture in some way, so expect a lot of your cards to combust every now and then. The duel with him was really difficult, and it lasted about like 12 minutes, but I got him eventually. And with this, the game is over? Nothing happened. He just says the duel was garbage and runs off. What gives? So going back to the scene with Ishizu, she tells you then and there that the only way to beat Merrick is by ending the duel with a god card. If you don't, nothing happens. Yugi also comes and reminds you later about this fact whenever you beat Merrick without a god card. Level with me here for a second. The god cards are terrible. Not because of the effects, but because you need three monsters to summon these. There are so many monsters in this game that never see the light of day even if they have good effects because they need two sacrifices. Now, to be fair, the gods in the game have complete immunity to negative card effects, but the three monsters you plan to sacrifice don't. It's very rare for me to even have two monsters on the field at this point in the game with different dimension cards being slung around like candy in every deck. After the Expert Cup, opponents start to have banned cards like Raigeki and Dark Hole. Now luckily, Harpies have a much easier time summoning multiple cards to the field because of Elegant Egotist, allowing them to summon more Harpies from the deck. And if I have multiple Last Wills in my hand, I can use them to summon all the monsters from the deck as well. But if he decides to summon Lava Golem on my field, there goes any plan to summon Obelisk. Keep in mind all the destruction cards in his deck make this way more annoying to pull off. But after a long and tedious grind, I was finally able to summon Obelisk and win the game from there. Yami Merrick vanishes to the shadows, with the regular Merrick returning back to normal and apologizing for everything. Accepting the apology, we celebrate the victory and call it a day. Now the game is over. This is close to being the best Dual Monsters ever game, period. Everything from the Beginner's Cup onwards is so fun and engaging with the carpool being good enough to be creative with the decks that you want to make at that point of the game. However, it took 90 something duels to even get to that point of the game. For several hours, the game goes nowhere and the opponents are either okay or absolute trash in the first few hours. Another issue the game has is the carpool post game. See, this game did a good job bringing in cards that were missing from the past games. It also did a good job with the cards that are obtainable throughout the main game. But the post-game selection is the worst I've ever seen. Several powerful cards from this era of Yu-Gi-Oh are completely missing. At first, I thought it was because the power of these cards were too high for the main campaign. But the reality is that they're just straight up missing. There are no Monarchs in this game, which pains me so much. Monarchs are some of my favorite cards, and they're all just missing. Gravekeepers are missing from a game where the Gravekeeper is the main antagonist. And apparently, this game is completely lacking fire monsters for some reason. Hey bro, I want to get this hot. See, you ain't say that bro. You gotta let the nigga know. <sighs> bro, what is he doing? Multiple Chaos Turbo cards are missing in the game as well. The worst being Chaos Sorcerer, being missing from the game entirely. You legit cannot make a Chaos deck in a game set in GOAT format. This is the reason why no one plays this game to practice GOAT. Because it's missing everything that makes GOAT, well, GOAT. It's the reason why I opted not to really engage with the post game. Because Monarchs was what I wanted to mess around with, but it doesn't exist. Now, don't get me wrong, the post game is very good. All the duelists in this game have upgraded decks, and Noah's base is back where you can have rematches with opponents that you can't find on the map anymore, like the Big Five and Yami Merrick. But I have no interest to do it because I can't even work towards the deck I want to have post game. So for the most part, I'm done with the game. I enjoyed the mid game to late game a lot. So much so that I highly recommend playing this game if you want an old school itch and somehow find a way to skip the start of the game. Shoot, you might stick with the game and do the post game as well if your favorite decks in the game. Unfortunately for me, I can't make some of my favorite GOAT format decks like Strike Ninja Monarchs, 
so I'll just move on from here. At this point, the next game that I have on the horizon is the Pokemon trading card game for the Game Boy Color. Thanks everybody who made it all the way to the end of the video, I greatly appreciate that. Until next time, I scoop.